time, 8 Pacific, we air a panel discussion on the future of newspapers held as part of the annual convention of the American Society of Newspaper Editors. Then at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we continue our coverage of the meeting with a discussion on civil rights since the release of the Kerner Commission report 20 years ago. Coming up at 2.10 p.m. Eastern Time, we air a hearing on the Marine Mammal Protection Act before the Senate Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee and the National Ocean Policy Study. Up next, a Democratic candidates debate held in New York Thursday by WCBS and Newsday. Good evening. Channel 2 News along with Newsday and New York Newsday is proud to present this presidential primary debate. The three candidates looking for votes in next Tuesday's Democratic presidential primary are all with us tonight. We welcome Governor Michael Dukakis, Senator Albert Gore, and Mr. Jesse Jackson. Along with us, Les Payne, the assistant managing editor of Newsday. He will join me in questioning these candidates tonight. But before we begin, we have a brief explanation of the rules of this debate. During the first half hour, the candidates will be questioned by the moderators. Each candidate will have a minute and a half to answer each question. The other two candidates can react to an answer for up to 30 seconds apiece. The candidates will be questioned in an order previously determined by drawing lots. In our second segment, the candidates will question each other. The answers to these questions must be no longer than one minute. The candidate posing the question may respond to that answer for up to 30 seconds. Finally, each candidate will make a closing statement of approximately 90 seconds with the order again determined by draw. And Mr. Jackson now receives the first question from Les Payne. Les? Mr. Jackson, we're in the hard drug consuming capital of the Western world with an addict population exceeding 200,000, and that's not counting infants born addicted. Let's lay aside for a minute your often quoted plan to use, to beef up the Coast Guard to deal with drugs at the borders. And I'd like to ask you what specifically would you do as president to interdict the supply of hard drugs on the streets of cities like New York? Well, we have to start at the source, I mean, the countries where the drugs are grown. A, I certainly want to have a summit meeting with Latin American leaders where the drugs are grown. The source, strengthen our border patrol. Thirdly, on these streets, we must, in fact, have stronger uh, patrol, but also a judicial system that will adjust to the drug crisis and have swifter justice. But it's a mistake to focus on the push and the consumer without putting the, the drug uh, lord and the deal in perspective. Cities cannot stop the flow of drugs. We must see drug flow as a dimension of our foreign policy. Either an inept dimension or a corrupt dimension, we must see drugs as a form of warfare and fight back with diplomatic, and yes, even border military strength. Any other response? Yeah, I'd like to say, first of all, that Jesse Jackson really has provided leadership on this issue. I've put forward a five-point proposal that I'd like to briefly summarize. I'd like to appoint a cabinet-level coordinator to engineer efforts in several areas. First of all, change our foreign policy priorities, as the Reagan administration did not do when they got the information about Noriega. Use the military as part of the effort to intercept planes and boats that are smuggling illegal drugs to our borders and shores have tougher law enforcement here at home and better coordination of federal and state authorities, and then have a comprehensive education and prevention campaign starting at the earliest grades in school. Les, let me just add to what both uh, Jesse and, and Al have said. Uh, I think the President of the United States and an administration have to set a standard. If we're doing business with drug-running Panamanian dictators, if we're funneling aid to the Contras through convicted drug dealers, if we're doing business with members of the Honduran military who themselves are making millions from drug running, how do we go to our kids and say, say no to drugs? We've got an administration that itself can't say no to drugs and drug peddlers. The point Al makes about education and prevention is also very important. Any drug enforcement officer will tell you that if we don't get serious about bringing drug education in the early elementary grades in every elementary school in this country, we're not going to win this fight. Governor, our last two presidents have been governors with limited experience in diplomacy. One had a vision of America as a guiding light for the world, a moral leader. The other saw America as the anti-communist crusader. 
Both of those are considered by many now to be simplistic and perhaps self-defeating concepts. With your limited amount of experience in diplomacy, what is your vision and how would you think it'd be any more successful than theirs has been? Well, I'm not sure my governors don't engage in diplomacy every day, but I understand we're talking about international diplomacy. You know, the fellow in this race with the longest foreign policy resume of any of us happens to be a fellow named George Bush. He's the guy that sat next to the president and did nothing while we traded arms to the Ayatollah for hostages. He's the fellow that went to the Philippines in the early 80s and commended Marcos and his commitment to democracy. He continues to support a failed and illegal policy in Central America. It's not how much time you spent in Washington. It's your values, it's your ability to pick good people, to work with the Congress, to understand the forces of change that are sweeping this world and to make those forces of change work for us and not against us. We have had great governors, too, in the state of New York, Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt, who went on to become great presidents and very strong international leaders, the governor of New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson, who did the same. We've had people who spent their entire lifetime in Washington, one of whom happened to do so badly that he had to resign his seat not too long ago. I don't think anyone in this state would seriously suggest that Mario Cuomo wasn't qualified no, I think to be a candidate for the presidency of the United States, even though he hadn't uh, had direct diplomatic experience. So uh, it's a question of value, strength, the quality and caliber of the people you pick, what kind of leadership you provide as a chief executive. And one of the reasons I'm running for the presidency is because I think the next president of the United States will have an extraordinary opportunity, not only to end this fiasco in Central America, but to make real progress in arms control and arms reduction. And I look forward to that opportunity. Well, with all due respect, the, the three governors uh, cited uh, have to deserve some comment. Franklin Roosevelt and Theodore Roosevelt both had some prior experience before they served uh, as governors. They were in Washington. They had prior experience. Woodrow Wilson's record on foreign policy is not generally looked back on as a, as a sterling success. In fact, it's generally uh, believed to have been uh, pretty poor if you look at the League of Nations battle and the serious misunderstanding. Uh, that, that led to that, uh, that, that, that debacle. Senator. I think the issue of experience is relevant in this race, and I think it's legitimate to bring it up. Yes, sir. Well, I'm convinced that's what's, there are two keys to foreign policy. One is to have the skill to negotiate, and the second is to have a vision of the world as it actually is. To that extent, uh, when Mr. Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev do meet, <clears throat> that's one eighth of the human race, seven eighths the people are locked out. In the future, they'll be in some relationship to that table. I put forth a foreign policy doctrine. A, we must support and strengthen international law. We must support self-determination, a commitment to economic development, commitment to human rights, and be consistent, whether Latin America, or Afghanistan, or Middle East, or South Africa, be consistent. So if we, in fact, we have, to, I'm sorry, have the vision, negotiating skills, whether one is a governor or not, one can do it. Thank you, sir. Senator Gore, the campaign results so far seem to indicate that you're essentially a regional candidate uh, who've not won a primary outside of the South. Uh, you've managed to amass 400 delegates. Uh, the polls in New York so far show that you've not yet broken into double digits. Uh, my question is, given that, uh, and given the fact that you're not likely to win the nomination, uh, is it not true that your campaign essentially now uh, is effectively used to bar the nomination of one of your other uh, opponents here? Well, no, and let me, uh, let me begin my response by challenging the, the, uh, the premises of your question. I disagree totally, uh, beginning with your very first statement. In fact, I have won two contests outside the South, the states of Nevada and Wyoming. Uh, I have uh, uh, talked about the same themes and proposals all over the country. Uh, and have amassed a great deal of support. Now, as for the polls, those same polls uh, indicated uh, that I was only going to carry one, possibly two states on Super Tuesday. We ended up carrying seven states that week. The polls have so frequently been wrong in this race, I think a lot of people would be <laughs> well advised to stop asking what do the polls say is going to happen and start asking what should happen and start asking the question, who should be the next president of the United States, who has the experience and the ability, the ideas, proposals, and vision to lead this country in the proper direction. I'm running to win in this state. I'm running to win the nomination. 
This race is far from over with. If you look at what's happened up until now, uh, both of my uh, distinguished opponents here on stage have gotten approximately 27, 28 percent of the popular vote. I've gotten 22 percent of the popular vote. If you look at the delegate count, it is a three-person race, and there are only three of us remaining. The fact is a lot of people in New York are looking for an alternative to the approach offered by both of my opponents, and that's why there is momentum beginning to occur in my campaign. That's why I've had significant Senator endorsements and a lot of excitement and movement. Gentleman response? No comment. <clears throat> Reverend Jackson, I, I ask this question with all respect, but it's a question that I have to ask. There are people in this town who remember the Jaime Town remark. There are people in this town who remember the Farrakhan incidents. There are people in this town who remember the Arafat embrace. There are also people in this town who remember the words of Eva Che Guevara with the Castro meeting. And there are people in this town who remember the remarks derogatory, perceived as being derogatory about, I wouldn't want to live in New York, it's a place where people steal. You've apologized or explained for most of those, but why should people simply put that aside and vote for you in New York, and especially in New York City? Well, because people in the human affairs uh, forgive, redeem, and move on. There are also people in this town who remember that when Reagan lay a wreath at Bitburg, I went to Strutton Hall concentration camp with Bruno Kreisky, who also remember when Reagan went to meet with Gorbachev and would not discuss human rights for Soviet Jewry and Armenians. I challenged him on, on human rights before the whole world. Who remember that when a, a Nazi war criminal was, was thought to be in, in Syria, uh, Elizabeth Holtman, Holtzman called me to contact Syria to seek his extradition. And so people remember what they choose to remember. People also remember that not only did I meet with Arafat, but I challenged him to change his course, to move to mutual recognition and away from a course of annihilation that he ought to affirm Israel's right to exist with secure borders and ought to support 242 and ought not have any, any language that is confusing about that. Leadership must do in the Middle East a difficult thing. Not just choose sides, but pull sides together. We must break the cycle of pain, break the cycle of death, move Israelis and Palestinians from mutual annihilation and mutual destruction to mutual security and mutual recognition. In my judgment, the approach would not involve threatening either, but offering the necessary aid and security to make mutual negotiations effective and successful. The people in this city must remember me as the one who has had a, an effective record in social justice at home and peace in the world. Thank you, sir. Any response, gentlemen? I would like to comment on it, because I think if we're going to have a healthy dialogue in this campaign, as all of us want to have a healthy dialogue, we've got to draw a distinction between past controversies and current controversies. I have some sharp disagreements with Jesse Jackson about uh, his view of the desirability of a Palestinian state, for example. I have never in this race brought up the comment about Jaime Town because he apologized for that some time ago and said he thought it was a mistake. I haven't talked about Farrakhan because I remember a statement last year, two years ago, that separated him from the views expressed there in a way that I thought was pretty clear. It's time, Senator. But where I'm sorry, a Palestinian state is concerned, and some of the other issues we've discussed, I think we can have a healthy and vigorous well, discussion we, we will, breaking new ground. We will, I promise you. Governor Dukakis? Mike, let me simply say this. Uh, we're going to have disagreement. We've had it on platforms, and this is one of many debates that we've been involved in. But in the last analysis, the people of New York have to look at each of the three of us and decide which one of us has the strength, the experience, the values, the ability to lead this country, to build a strong economic future, to help lead an America that we can be proud of. And I hope they will look at us in that light, judge us, not only on our records, but on our vision of the future. And if they do, then I think we'll have a good, solid result on Tuesday. Governor Dukakis, you preside over a state with a population that is less than about three quarters the size of New York City. Your $10.9 billion budget is less than half the budget of that presided over by Mayor Koch. Your first term as governor is viewed by some as not being a roaring success. Uh, why should we expect that your first term as president would be any different consider considering that you have not had foreign policy experience, you've not dealt with Gorbachev, and you're inheriting a deficit of $150 billion? 
because I've been the chief executive for 10 years. I've balanced budgets. I think I'm the only candidate in the race left who's ever balanced a budget. I've picked cabinets. I've appointed judges for life. I've worked with legislators. And I'm very proud of my record. Proud of a record that has brought my state the hottest and the strongest state economy in the country, an unemployment rate of 2.9%, over 400,000 new jobs, good jobs, in the past five years alone. A state which this week is on its way to becoming the first state in the history of this country to guarantee every one of its citizens basic health insurance, something that we should be doing for every family in this country. A state that is improving its schools, that has what the Drug Enforcement Agency says is the best program of drug education and prevention in the country. And a state which I'd like to think is, is a model for many of the kinds of things that we want to do all across this country. A state, by the way, with a minority unemployment rate of 5.5%, down from 14 five years ago. Still too high as far as I'm concerned. I'm not going to be satisfied until there's no minority unemployment rate in my state and in this country. A state which has helped over 45,000 welfare families to move from welfare to work with training for those welfare mothers for real jobs and daycare for those youngsters. That's the kind of vision, those are the kinds of values that I think the people of this country stand for. That's the kind of leadership they want and I think I can provide it. It seems to me that the governor's to be commended for doing a good job managing the budget of Massachusetts. Fundamental now, however, is the challenge to reverse Reaganomics. That's an even bigger challenge. It's one we must, we can reach, but we must confront it. To reverse Reaganomics, how did we get in this hole? We doubled the military budget in peacetime and a $600 billion tax break. Do we have the courage and the vision to reverse it? If we freeze the military budget from 1993, freeze it, it's already exorbitant and bloated, we'll be saving $60 billion a year by 1993. Challenging that budget, uh, the Reagan budget deficit, and fair taxes must be addressed to come out of this hole in an orderly five-year plan. In spite of the furlough program that I've criticized and the loss of manufacturing jobs, uh, in Massachusetts and other problems. I want to stipulate that I think Mike Dukakis has been a good governor of Massachusetts and that's another reason why I think he ought to continue being governor of Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, today uh, the uh, reports indicate all three of you endorsed a plan aimed at getting homeless families out of welfare hotels and into private homes. <clears throat> Senator Gore, were you to become president, how would you move to end what apparently has become a nationwide crisis in housing. And how would you, having served all these many years in Congress and in the Senate, expect in this era of budget cuts and, and tax problems to be able to finance what seems to be a national necessity to raise major amounts of money? Well, first of all, let's look at the heavy expense of these short-term emergency responses that cities are forced into, like the welfare hotels, which turn out to be more expensive frequently than the longer term, more stable, and more effective responses. Homelessness is an issue on which I've taken leadership nationally, provided leadership nationally. Three years ago, when the issue didn't have a, a lot of prominence and wasn't uh, very popular to talk about, I sponsored the first comprehensive measure in the Senate uh, to deal with homelessness. In fact, uh, as I went around to my colleagues to try to find co-sponsors, uh, nobody wanted to touch it. Only one senator would co-sponsor it, and that's Patrick Moynihan from here in New York. Of course, he's been an expert in this area for a long time. We have to look at various dimensions of the problem. We have to attack the catastrophe in our treatment of the mentally ill and start providing the community mental health treatment centers that were, that were supposed to be there when we emptied out the large institutions. We have to deal with victims of domestic violence, alcohol and drug abuse, runaways, and the kids that Father Ritter calls throwaways, veterans. But most of all, we have to provide a new commitment to low income and affordable housing. This administration has cut our commitment to housing by 85%. That's why men, women, and children are falling through the gaps in the safety net onto the sidewalks. It's a question of priorities and taking a long-term approach rather than a short-term And a approach. brief follow-up, if I may. How are you going to pay for that? Where will the money come from? It's a question of priorities. It's a question of cutting wasteful spending in areas of much lower priority and across the board, making structural changes in the budget, such as a partial means testing of some entitlement programs. 
Uh, and as a last resort, we may eventually have to have new tax revenue. I'm not proposing new tax revenue as a first resort, only as a, re a last resort. But as we attack this problem, we do have to understand that it costs a great deal of money to respond on a short-term emergency crisis basis. Senator, I have to stop you there. Yes. Mike, we've got to make some choices in this country. Are we going to spend billions on Star Wars and MX missiles running around on railroad cars? Or do we really believe that the citizens of this country are entitled to decent and affordable housing? Not just families of low and moderate income, but young families that are trying to find a house which on Staten Island costs $280,000. Now that's a commitment we have to make. I've built housing for families of low and moderate income. This country has to build housing for families of low and moderate income. And there are people out there all across the country that would work with the president to build that kind of partnership. Bankers, builders, developers, nonprofit agencies, community action agencies. They're waiting for a president who is prepared to make that commitment. And that's why we have homeless families in this country. A 90% cut in housing for families of low and moderate income under the Reagan administration. Mr. Jackson. The governor suggests that we're going to have to, to freeze or alter the present commitment of, of this humongous military budget begin to reinvest in our own infrastructure, uh, Williamsburg Bridge and housing, and not just more exotic missiles. We need to take that to its logical conclusion. Have a specific suggestion, because the 86 tax bill, the money pool has dried up, the deficit has driven housing off of the agenda. I propose that we take 10% of public pension funds, government secured, a fair rate of return guaranteed, six billion a year over 10 years, leverage that money with, a, with vacant properties and state tax breaks and concretely begin to build affordable housing and small business loans. Okay, I have Jackson. that I, we have in to... writing and have numbers attached to it. Okay, sir. Mr. Jackson, some Arab Americans recently have accused you of courting Jewish voters in this New York City by backing away from your previous tough stand on the Palestinian question. Now, previously, when you've called for an independent homeland for the Palestinians, you have taken pains to indicate that it would be unarmed. Would you tell me how is it possible for a state to defend itself uh, in that very troubled region if it c cannot man an army and an air defense? If you go from, your pres from the present state of, of occupation and pain and violence to a new state, what you really would have to do is negotiate in a transition that would take into account a Israel's need for secure borders, the Palestinians need to have a state in the West Bank and, and in the Gaza. The transition period to involve UN or some force to give mutual assurance at security. You wouldn't go from the present state where we are now to a rival military state next door. It's going to take some time. Even Camp David left some time for transition for the Egypt and the Israeli agreement to begin to take place. If we can get from the present state of mutual annihilation to mutual recognition and mutual security and land to peace, we have to take the time. I support for the Palestinians a sovereign people, a state, a homeland, a place to exist. But one in doing so should offer uh, aid and support to both. I say this quickly. When I met with Mr. Sadat in 1979, Granted him on having the courage to go to Israel. He said, yes, I had courage, but I also had land, and I also had assurances in my pocket. This government, the next government, must offer those assurances in order to make it feasible all for both parties. I support the state. Yes. Well, I think it was a step forward, not backward, when uh, Jesse Jackson said last Sunday he would not meet with uh, Yasser Arafat as president, absent some significant changes such as uh, recognizing Israel, etc., renouncing terrorism. But the problem with creating a Palestinian state uh, is exactly as you, the premise of your question suggests. Traditionally, independent states have had the opportunity to, have had the right to arm themselves, enter into alliances, perhaps with sworn uh, enemies of Israel, and the proximity of that area to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and the narrowest part of uh, Israel is why it is such a dangerous proposal, in my view, Senator, and why I, I have differences you, with both of my opponents on the question. Go on. Well, the fundamental problem, however, remains. With the, with the exception of Anwar Sadat, we have not had an Arab leader who was prepared to stand up and say, yes, I agree, Israel has a right to exist within secure borders, or people mm -hmm. have a right to live in dignity and freedom. We commit ourselves to res resolutions 242 and 338, and we're prepared to go forward with negotiations on that basis. I think the job of the next president of the United States 
has got to be to try to work every day, every week, and every month to create an environment within which Arab leaders are prepared to stand up and do what Sadat did in 1979. Governor, uh, the AIDS crisis I've heard you describe as the greatest health crisis facing modern man. What can we do with this right now? What would you do with this problem as president, aside from throwing money at it? Is there something that the Reagan administration hasn't done aside from spend enough money? Is there a moral tone or what? We haven't had any leadership on this issue from the Reagan administration. They've kicked it around. They've stumbled it around. Uh, they've walked away from it. Uh, this is an administration that couldn't even get itself to appoint a commission. And when it did so, it created chaos. There are three fundamental things we must do, Mike, if we're serious about dealing with what I think correctly I and others have called the single most serious public health crisis in our lifetimes. First, we have to commit resources, and yes, it's going to take resources to find a cure, to find treatment, to find what it will take to cure this disease and to treat it. And we should be doing that and committing those resources. It's too important not to. Secondly, we've got to be serious about education and prevention. And that is why comprehensive health education, beginning in the early elementary grades, with an emphasis on drugs and AIDS, helping our youngsters to understand the consequences of their own behavior, is so important and something I'm so strongly committed to. Finally, we've got to provide caring and compassionate treatment for the victims of AIDS. And that takes presidential leadership. We have not had presidential leadership, as I think everybody knows, for the past seven years. We've had a Surgeon General who was willing to stand up and exercise a little intestinal fortitude and courage, but we have not had leadership from the White House. Mr. Jack, uh, Mr. Gore. Well, it seems to me that, that A, that we must move from hysteria to education. That's why when 600,000 gays and lesbians and their parents and relatives gathered in Washington October the 11th, I alone stood with them to assure them that I cared for them as human beings. We need research for all of the right reasons because it's not just a crisis among gays and lesbians. It is an international health crisis. But leadership must set the moral tone. We must assure people that we care, remove the hysteria, and get down to basic education and then prevention. Senator. Again, you must compare the cost to the cost of not going forward. Uh, I was at uh, the Bellevue AIDS Clinic in, in this city and saw the human impact there as I've seen it in AIDS clinics across this country. But if you look at the books and measure the financial impact, uh, the Public Health Service estimates that within two years, the consequences of AIDS will cost this nation $16 billion per year. If we could speed up the finding of a cure by one week, we could pay for the entire National Academy of Sciences research agenda. Okay, we well, also need there, education and prevention, uh, new financial structures to cope with it, and leadership on the difficult and sensitive questions of testing and confidentiality of data. Yes. Senator Gore, if Soviet troops would invade Europe and conventional forces couldn't hold them back, <laughs> are there any conditions under which you would consider using nuclear weapons? <laughs> well, you know, traditionally, presidents of the United States and major candidates for the nomination of one of our major political parties have never said, I will use uh, U.S. strategic nuclear weapons in these circumstances or in those circumstances. The controversy that arose uh, yesterday because of an interview uh, given by Mike Dukakis to uh, another newspaper in this city uh, came about when he was asked, can you envision uh, circumstances in which you would l launch our strategic nuclear weapons first. And he said, yes, yes, and then laid out the scenario that uh, you, you describe in the premise of your question. That is a serious mistake. It's never been done by a sitting president of the United States because our nation has, as a matter of official policy, tried to keep uncertainty in the minds of Soviet leaders about what our response would be. Let me tell you why. If we told Soviet leaders in advance that our response to a conventional invasion of Germany would be the launching of strategic U.S. nuclear missiles at the Soviet Union, that would invite them to calculate that if they invaded, they would have to uh, then actively consider a preemptive nuclear strike of their own against the United States. That's why Time I Senator. think it's irresponsible and unwise. 
and should be modified. Governor DeCarlo. Les, was that an answer to your question? <laughs> Not precisely. I don't think he really answered your question. Yeah, I did answer the question by saying that it's unwise for a president of the United States or a candidate for the nomination of a major party to spell out in advance the conditions under which he would launch a strategic nuclear attack against the Soviet Union. That's never been done for good reason. It's counter to U.S. policy. It's counter to NATO policy. Still hasn't answered your question. Uh, I support U.S. and NATO policy, and I think Al Gore knows what that is. No, the well, real challenge... I do, in fact, know what it is. The real challenge... I don't think you do. <laughs> the real challenge facing the next president of the United States is whether or not he's prepared to take advantage of what I think is the best opportunity for meaningful arms control and arms reduction we've had in our lifetime. An opportunity to negotiate deep cuts in strategic weapons, a test ban treaty, to begin serious negotiations leading to the reduction of conventional forces in Europe with deeper cuts on the Soviet side. I'm ready for that challenge. I think it's a tremendous opportunity, and I'd love to have the chance to pursue it. It seems to me that there's a real danger in those of us who may very well lead our country to get trapped into a hypothetical situation, who will shoot your gun first and destroy the whole world to prove that you got macho. What makes the most sense is to pursue the INF agreement, now deeper and mutually verifiable cuts in the Soviet Union, get Gorbachev to reduce the tank advantage asymmetrically on, on the Warsaw side, and move toward ending the very threat of war, because the 200 nuclear stations in Europe in a conventional war is in fact a nuclear war, and that in fact is mutual destruction, and our aim really must be coexistence. Mr. Jackson, there was a terrorist attack on a U.S. installation in Naples, Italy today. Five people were killed, and as far as we know, no Americans were among the dead. But it coincides with the anniversary of the American bombing of Libya. There is indication to believe that it might be more than just a coincidence, that it might be a terrorist strike aimed at reprisals for that. What is your attitude towards terrorists when do you think American military action against terrorism is called for, if ever? First, it, it is called for, but you must first have accurate information. Even with the unilateral attack on Libya, we later found that the, persons, the person who was killed was not killed, as later information revealed, by a Libyan. You must first get accurate information. Second, you must involve regional allies who must live with the aftermath of the situation. The aftermath of the attack on Libya left such a bad taste in our allies' mouth who had to live through it. Some of them will not even let us fly over their countries. Perhaps the reason why two American pilots uh, were killed uh, on the way back. But also, when we made the decision to go to the Persian Gulf, which was a good decision for stability and security, we had to go it alone because we could not get a multilateral support. The point is that something fundamentally dangerous about trying to solve international crises unilaterally. It's a pretty good rule to involve allies in this proposition. All of our allies must be against terrorism. We must measure terrorism by one yardstick and use approaches that in fact work. We cannot just react uh, and, and fire without knowing what the object is and what our options are. Gentlemen. Mike, we've got to be tough about terrorism. Terrorism is nothing less than international crime. And the way you fight crime is with professional law enforcement, with undercover operations, and with military strikes against terrorist bases, if necessary. On the other hand, we've got to make sure that we have the information, as Jesse points out. We've got to make sure that those strikes are against military bases, not against civilian targets. But if we aren't serious about going after terrorism, and if we aren't prepared to do so, and adopt a policy of never making concessions to terrorists, then we're going to lose this fight. What we did in trading arms for hostages in Iran was absolutely the worst kind of policy, and we're going to live with its consequences for a long time. Senator? The Reagan-Bush administration has failed in trading those arms to the Ayatollah for hostages and has created great problems for our nation. But the next Democratic president, in responding to terrorism, must be willing not just to talk tough, but to show some strength. One of the differences that I have had in earlier debates with uh, both Mike and Jesse was on this very point, the response or retaliation against Libya. We shouldn't have tried to target Gaddafi, but when we had clear information that they were involved in planning and issuing the orders to kill an American serviceman, we told them not to do it, Senator, they went ahead anyway, Senator, we I think to, we yeah. had the right to retaliate. Okay, thank you, sir. 
Governor Dukakis, you seem to have agreed the, uh, agreed the other day that the United States should provide defensive weapons to frontline states in order for them to defend themselves against bombing from South Africa. Now, along those lines, would you consider giving to countries like uh, Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, or Zambia, the Stinger, or perhaps the Hawk missiles to defend themselves? And what about Angola? Well, so I would uh, be very reluctant to uh, begin to arm more and more states, uh, whether in Africa or other places. Uh, I want to help those states. I want to help them to uh, move away from the kind of dependency they have on uh, the economy of South Africa. I would end this absolutely bizarre policy of ours in Angola, where we're supplying uh, Savimbi, whose principal patron is South Africa, so that he can attack American oil companies defended by the Cuban army. But uh, I think we can help those nations. I think we can help them to move away from their dependency without uh, necessarily uh, arming them and others in a way that uh, will simply fuel the fires of, of war and conflict. What defensive America. weapons, though, did you have in mind? When I don't you... remember ever having made that statement, frankly. I don't know who did, but I don't remember having made that statement. I think, I, I, I think if, if I can uh, uh, come to his defense a little bit on this, I think that some people heard the statements that both of us made about giving aid to the frontline states and interpreted that as military aid when we were really talking about building uh, railroads and making them economically independent of South Africa. But let me, let me comment on your Stinger, the Stinger part of your question. You know, I think it has proven to be a good idea to give Stinger missiles to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. But they are not purely defensive weapons. And we have to be very careful about uh, in whose hands Stinger missiles falls, fall, because they are capable of bringing down civilian airliners Senator. and are a, a dangerous potential terrorist weapon if they fall into the wrong hands. First of all, South Africa is state-sponsored terrorism. So if you have diplomatic ties with South Africa, you have diplomatic ties with terrorists. If you negotiate with South Africa, you're negotiating with terrorists. There must be a, multi, a multiple approach. A, unless there are open, free, and fair elections, all the U.S. corporations out of South Africa by date certain. Number two, build a barrier corridor out of Mozambique and Limpopo Railroad, Zimbabwe, and Zambia will not be landlocked and offer frontline states defensive weapons to protect themselves from South Africa's constant invasion. Not offensive weapons, but defensive weapons to protect themselves from the constant bombardment of their infrastructure. It is now uh, April the 14th, which means tomorrow is April the 15th. And I don't assume that I have to go beyond that in telling you all what tomorrow is. Americans are dealing with a more complicated than ever tax form. And uh, in an interview with your Republican opponent a couple of days ago, he assured me that under a Bush administration, taxes would not be going up. The programs you're espousing tonight mm -hmm. seem to be programs that are expensive. And you've, you've all talked about cutting waste in government, but it all seems pretty obvious that tax, taxes would probably go up. Uh, are we talking <coughs> about major tax increases to support the Democrats' plans to get Reaganomics out of our system? Well, you're not talking about a tax increase in a Gore administration. I have not proposed tax increases. I have, however, said that if the preferable measures for reducing the deficit don't suffice to build and sustain the bipartisan commitment to fiscal responsibility, which absolutely must be established in the next administration, then as a last resort, we may have to turn to new tax revenue only as a last resort. Now, I've specified some a particular proposal so that people will know in advance of what I would turn to first in the event we were forced to move in that direction. And we would not move toward additional taxes uh, that would uh, fall uh, disproportionately on uh, middle and low income American working families. I've talked about a luxury tax on purchases of more than $30,000. I've talked about changes in the corporate tax to go to a 40% rate coupled with a new net investment tax credit and other measures designed not to put the burden on middle and low income working families. But let me stress that I think the American people have a right to expect that we will first of all make every effort to get at wasteful spending and low priority items in the defense budget, in the domestic budget, and, and have structural changes to make savings as well. Yes, sir. Mike, uh, let me say this, and you had the interview with the Vice President and I didn't, but he's bouncing around like a rubber ball on this issue. The day he announced he said no new taxes, two days later he said maybe, kind of like the captain of the pinafore. Uh, now I don't know what he's saying. 
Uh, no serious candidate for the presidency can rule out new taxes, as Alice pointed out. But we aren't collecting over $100 billion a year in taxes owed that aren't being paid in this country. And I think it's grossly unfair to the vast majority of American taxpayers who are paying their taxes and will pay them tomorrow <coughs> to impose new taxes on them before we make a strong effort to make sure that those billions and billions in unpaid taxes are collected. That's where I'd begin. Mr. Jackson. To reverse Reaganomics, a military budget is going to have to correspond with good sense. It does not make sense to be spending $150 billion a year defending Europe and Japan 42 years after the war 20% less of their formula share than seven years ago when they can share the burden of their own defense. It does not make sense to me to spend that kind of money every year defending Europe and Japan with Williamsburg Bridge closed tonight and homeless in the streets of New York City. It means fundamentally changing priorities. We uh, now enter the second round of our program this evening, the uh, round in which the candidates will have an opportunity to ask questions of each other. Once again, we drew for lots to determine who would go first, second, and third. And Senator Gore, you have the opportunity, I believe, to ask the first question of whomever you choose. I'll ask my first question of Governor Dukakis, and I'll, I'll pick up on one of uh, Les's questions about nuclear weapons. I'm sure you anticipate this because we've had a, a, a controversy over the last uh, 48 hours about it. But you did say in response to a question about whether or not you would launch uh, a first strike with strategic nuclear weapons against the Soviet Union, that yes, you would, uh, if the uh, circumstances evolved in a way that had uh, the Russians invading Germany with conventional weapons. Now, did you mishear the question? Did you misunderstand the question? I really think that, that it should be clarified. It does raise the experience uh, issue, and I think you ought to have a chance to respond to it. Al, when it comes to experience, uh, I wouldn't trade mine for, for yours. Uh, last week you spoke to the Council of Presidents in this city told them that you regretted that King Khalid had not uh, supported the Schultz plan. Uh, you're going to be an awfully good guy if you can bring Khalid back. He died in 1982. And the question's about nuclear weapons. And had, uh, and had a heart attack. And he the question's been, about nuclear weapons, He hasn't Mike. been the king of Saudi Arabia, at least since 1982, unless you know something about him that we don't know. Um, I support U.S. policy. I support NATO policy with respect to the use of nuclear weapons. You know what those policies are. But I don't believe that's going to be the fundamental challenge that faces the next president. He's going to have an opportunity, as I said just a few minutes ago, to sit down at the negotiating table to go far beyond the INF treaty, to negotiate deep cuts in strategic weapons, the test ban treaty, a ban on chemical warfare, I hope, to get serious about uh, negotiations leading to the a reduction of conventional forces in Europe. Time uh, Gorbachev has indicated that he would be prepared to make deeper cuts on the Soviet side. The time one of the reasons I'm running for the presidency is because I want the opportunity to do that. I think it's an extraordinary opportunity. For Senator Gore, you have uh, 30 seconds to rebut. Well, one of the purposes of a primary campaign is to address weaknesses as well as strengths uh, among the candidates for the nomination so our party can put its best foot forward and have the strongest message. And I would just submit again that you've got to correct that, Mike. An, an American president or a major candidate for the nomination cannot say that he would launch a first strike with strategic nuclear weapons against the Soviet Union. Well, you've got to clarify, because what that's what the transcript to do is stop says. Up. And <laughs> also, you have said in trying to clarify it, that NATO doctrine and U.S. Time doctrine Senator. is no early first use, yeah. and it is not. Let me suggest Time. something. Don't pick up the morning newspaper and then have a press conference. Give me a buzz. I'll tell you exactly what I said, and there'll be much less confusion in this Well, case. the transcript uh, bears out exactly uh, the I'll premise of the question you. that I we have must, asked. Uh, we I'll we must to respond to it one. at some point. Gentlemen, it needs to be clarified. provide you with a transcript. In the meantime, Go. you can tell us Well, you provided a transcript, but you left out the key exchange. I, I hesitate to jump in because <laughs> I'm enjoying this, but I've been told I must. Um, <laughs> Governor Dukakis, you now have I'm an I'm waiting for King Khalid to come back to the death. Yes, sir. Senator can tell us And if he does, he'll lead our newscast at 11, I assure you. Uh, it is now your opportunity I mean, to Al ask the... I uh, for president. He ought to yeah. run for something even bigger than that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to be easy. Uh, you may now ask the uh, question of whomever you choose, and I would remind all of our uh, candidates that we have uh, 30 seconds for each question, followed by a minute okay. response and 30 seconds for rebuttal. Jesse, you and I and Al have talked a lot about the importance of quality education. Uh, and one of the most serious problems that we'll be facing in this country will be the fact that half of our public school teachers are going to retire in the next five to ten years. 
And you and I have been on lots of college campuses over the course of the past many months, and we're not meeting an awful lot of young people who want to go into public school teaching. I've suggested scholarships, loan forgiveness, reviving the National Teacher Corps. What specifically do you think we can do to encourage first-rate young people in this country to go into teaching and good teachers to stay in teaching? It's going to involve a commitment to, to pay teachers money commensurate with their challenge. When I, I go to schools across the country and ask about the level of adult usage and teenage pregnancy and guns in schools, teachers in many instances are in a war zone at great risk. And oftentimes with too little parental participation or support, teachers need to have more job security. On the one hand, the government can open up the doors of opportunity, better pay, more scholarships, reduction of loans. On the other hand, a missing element in this whole form is that parents must assume a much greater responsibility in being teachers' co-partners in, in the rearing of their children. Just to have opportunity, without the effort, the character and the co-partnership will not be sufficient. You have an opportunity to rebut if you care to, Governor. No rebuttal except to say that uh, I hope we all understand, Mike, just how serious this problem is. Uh, actually, I think in New York City, for example, it will be in less than 10 years that we'll have as many as uh, one-third to one-half of the teachers leaving the classroom because of retirement. And uh, I think the next president of the United States must be the number one advocate for good teaching and good teachers in this country. We've got to make teaching a valued and honored profession once again if we're serious about providing our youngsters with the kind of quality education they must have. Mr. Jackson, it's now your opportunity, sir. Al, that's a projection. The next 10 years that we'll have a, a trillion dollar need in infrastructure development. The Williamsburg Bridge has closed. It is now reported that two bridges collapse a day. I mean, just an outstanding uh, collapse of our infrastructure. How do you propose that we finance an investment in our infrastructure to begin to rebuild bridges and build affordable housing? Well, the closing of this bridge and the collapse of the bridge on I-95 a, a year ago are directly related to the unwillingness of the Reagan-Bush administration to properly manage the highway trust fund. We collect money now from the gasoline tax, which is put into a specific trust fund and intended to be used for the repairing of bridges, for the fixing of potholes, for the improvement of our highways and roads. And yet what this administration has done, because of their complete mismanagement of fiscal policy, is they have decreed that the money in that trust fund will be allowed to grow and grow and grow without being spent for the purposes it was intended to be used for in order to give an artificial appearance on the books of the so-called unified budget, an artificial appearance of a lower budget deficit than the one they've actually created, which is big enough. Time, I've Senator. called for, the, for a change in the management of that highway trust fund to prevent the closing of bridges like uh, Westchester and, and to uh, prevent the, uh, the collapse of bridges like the one on I-95. Do, do you see any correspondence between the, Westmoreland, I mean, the size of, of our military budget, the cost overruns, the $200 toilet seats, just the appropriation of this as a form of defense and an adequate commitment to rebuilding our infrastructure, bridges, affordable housing? Well, I think they're willing to... Excuse me, Senator, to... according to the rules, I cannot permit you to answer that because we're not entitled to re-answer a question that's Not even the twice. remainder of his 30 seconds? No, he's already taken it. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, I'm I sorry. will give you the opportunity I'm to sorry. pose another question to uh, your fellow candidates. Oh, all right, fine. Well, well let, me, let me shift gears on this then and, and ask a, a question that's in the same area that uh, I was trying to ask Mike about in, in nuclear weapons. The last Democratic administration joined with our NATO allies to propose deployment of American missiles in Europe and simultaneously the negotiation with Russia of the, for the removal of their missiles and ours. That strategy was successful. Now, uh, a few years ago, you proposed a unilateral halt in the deployment of our missiles. Wouldn't that have made it impossible or at least a lot more difficult to secure the kind of treaty that we just got that removes their missiles as well as ours. Well, I believe if we had uh, ratified SALT II, we would now be in SALT III with a much broader agreement. At some point, we, we simply stop the initiative 
And I am not convinced that our adding more weapons in Europe, missiles, was a stimulus to get Gorbachev to come to the table, that there were other reasons why that took place, like crisis in his own internal economy. And perhaps a perception, his uh, stopping the testing and deployment of missiles and taking an initiative toward Western Europe change in some sense Reagan's strategy. I do not think the build-up drove us to this point. There is room there for reasonable disagreement. I think that we had the capacity to go to the table seven years ago. When we missed a ratifying SALT II, we missed a great opportunity even then. Because I think if we had, we'd now be in SALT III. And what is happening now, Time, Mr. Jackson. maybe not the specifics that would have taken place, we would be well on our way toward uh, a reduction in arms. We will, we will have to dispense with rebuttals in the second round because of time considerations. So it is now Governor Dukakis's chance to pose a question. Al, the oil import tax, as you know, would impose a $50 billion burden on the people of this country, uh, would make it difficult, if not impossible, for many elderly couples to stay in their homes, it would impose additional costs on homeowners, on farmers, probably cost thousands of jobs. You voted, I think, consistently against the oil import tax uh, in the Senate, uh, then went to Texas during the primary campaign and said to the folks in Texas, well, I'd consider it. Uh, we're now in New York. Are you for it or against it? And if so, why? What I said was I think the arguments are stronger in favor of some measure like an oil import fee if there were safeguards to prevent the harsh impact on users of home heating oil. I believe there are two reasons why some modified measure should at least be given some consideration. You're correct in saying that I have never voted for it, and I have never said I'm for it. But I've said that as the level of oil imports increases dramatically past the level that they were at in 1973 when the OPEC nations, Arab and otherwise, uh, got us in a stranglehold, as we pass that danger point again, the argument in favor of discouraging the rapid increase of uh, imported oil uh, becomes a little bit stronger. Time Secondly, seven. the obvious need to look at new sources of revenue from somewhere also mitigates toward giving a little more serious consideration to ideas of this kind. Senator, I've I must never voted you, for sir. it. Never, never said I was for it. Mr. Jackson, it's now your opportunity. Uh, let me ask a basic question. You say you will not negotiate with terrorists under any conditions. Right. A, do you consider South Africa state-sponsored terrorism? Well, it's certainly something akin to it, Jesse. Thus, would you negotiate with them or leverage with them, A, to break up that system? Well, I think uh, when you have an existing government of this kind, uh, as a practical matter, we've got to do everything we can to see if we can get them to understand the kind of uh, tragedy that uh, they're heading towards, Jesse. Uh, so I wouldn't refuse to talk to them. But when I say, uh, that I'm against concessions to terrorists, concessions to hostage takers. I mean that when you're fighting international terrorism and you offer to swap something for those hostages, you are in effect giving up. That's what we did in 1985. Governor, let's that's stop an, you there. That's an invitation to uh, terrorists and hostage takers to do it and do it and do it again, and we're going to live with the consequences of what we, we must did stop in there. For a long and that, time, that is the end of our second round. It is now time to uh, go to the closing statements. Each of the candidates will be given an opportunity to uh, make one final statement. Once again, we drew for lots for position to determine who would go first, second, and third. And Mr. Jackson, you have an opportunity now to give your closing remarks. In the final analysis, as you go to the poll on April 19th, what do we expect of a president? One who, will, who knows and who will respect the law. One who will convene the American family. My campaign has the broadest cross-section the most multicultural, the most inclusive of any campaign, I've reached out to the people. If on Wednesday morning you were about to lose your job and Lorenzo was about to bust your union, indeed as he's doing at Eastern Airlines, who would you want to argue your case to save your job? If you had to have someone to face the drug lords and break up the flow of drugs in this country, who would you think would have the leadership qualities to fight that war and be determined to win. If you had to get your child a scholarship in school and wanted someone to argue your case, well, who would you look to? If you had a relative in a foreign jail and wanted someone 
to argue your case and to deliver for you who do you want to argue your case? In the real sense, whoever can deliver is electable. If I win, it means hope is electable. It means justice is electable. It means action is electable. In the real sense, New York, when I win, you win. Together, we the people can win. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Senator Gore, your closing remarks, sir. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed this debate, and I hope those of you watching here and at home have enjoyed it also. I think we've had a good discussion. I've served for 12 years in the United States Senate, and before that, the House of Representatives, and I've won successfully a whole series of battles in behalf of working men and women. That's the kind of leadership, experience, and commitment that I want to take into the White House to put the presidency and the nation's government back on the side of working families. I want to have an effective response to the drug crisis in this nation. I want to have an all-out assault against the AIDS epidemic. Effective leadership to combat the scourge of homelessness in America. I want to provide measures that will rebuild our economic strength. And I want to go to work on what I believe is one of the best opportunities since the end of World War II for verifiable arms control, as Gorbachev may very well be offering a new set of possibilities for redefining our relationship with the Soviet Union. We must have a strong and intelligent role for America in the world, standing by our allies, but reaching out for new opportunities. Now, some in this race will advise you to figure out what you're afraid of and vote on the basis of your fears. I'm asking you to vote on the basis of your hopes. We're often confronted with a choice between hope and fear, I offer you the hope of a new kind of leadership, a presidency that is an agent for change in America, not just tinkering around the edges, but fundamental change. A vote for Gore is a vote for Gore. I ask you to vote for hope and for new leadership April 19th. Thank you, Senator Gore. Governor Dukakis. Next Tuesday, the people of New York will have an opportunity.